These testimonials are representative of my or our experiences, but the exact results and experience will be unique and individual to each person. The information provided herein is not medical advice and is not intended to substitute for the advice of your personal physician or other healthcare providers. Well, hello, everybody. This is your host, Leanne Hayden. And before we get started on this week's episode, before I bring our guest in, I just wanted to make a little bit of an announcement. It is summer here in New England. And if you guys know New England, uh, we get a few months of summer. So what does that mean for the podcast? This is the first time I'm going to be doing this. So I am going to be taking a little break from podcasting because I have a lot of trips, travel plans, and a lot of things going on for the summer. So this is going to be the last episode for this time of year. We're going to take a break throughout the summer, and I will be back in September with more guests, uh, more stories, more of all the things that you love about the Beautiful Bag podcast. I just wanted to make that little bit of an announcement before we get started into this episode. So stay tuned. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Beautiful Bag Podcast. I am your host, Leanne Hayden, and I am here with your guest, Leanne Watanabe. See, they say it right. They say it right. I love it. I love it. Leanne is from Hawaii, so she lives all the way over in Hawaii. Um, so it's nice and bright and early uh, in the morning for her as we're recording this, and it's the beautiful afternoon here in New England. Uh, Leanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too. I've been watching you. We've been connected on Instagram for a few years now, and I've been watching you do your workouts and get ready for your fitness shows and all those wonderful things. And we're going to talk about all that stuff because we have so much in common when it comes to that. Um, You know, so let's start start with a little bit about your journey. Okay, like um, with with so what yeah so you started um you know your journey is I mean from what I know of you you, you've always been into fitness and triathlons and working out and all the wonderful things but you um you know you had UC and it pretty much took life so why don't you tell a little bit about that story yeah so I uh, I was kind of like my what my husband calls a late bloomer because my husband was a spent his whole life being an athlete. And I never, I was more like a, a bookworm kind of thing, a school kind of type of gal. And um, so I found fitness later in life in, in college. And so it really started to work out. And like every other gal, when you meet your first boyfriend, you're like, oh my God. And you think like everything is wrong with you and you have to like get it all together. So that's why I started working out. Um, and I had met a, a gal at the gym who kind of, took me under her wing and she became like one of my best friends. She was an old school marathon runner. And I say old school because high mileage, these hundred mile week people out there. And she sought me out and she, I remember she was like, Hey, you look strong. You should come run with me. And I think at that time as like a young 20 something year old who was sort of exercising for again, strictly weight loss to change how I looked, um, to have an adult or someone else, uh, sort of mentored me and and give me this belief that wow despite what I think I look like or what I weigh because I've always ha- held on to some weight on me um, my whole life battled like a weight issue since I was a young child my mom fixated on that and, uh, so when she made me believe that I could kind of do this big thing like marathon and all this stuff I was like you're crazy but Fast forward, she got me started racing and we trained together. And I remember I was training for my first marathon here in Honolulu. So a marathon is always 26.2 miles for anybody who doesn't know. And again, while I was training for all this stuff, I had a lot of GI issues. But I had always, if you're like a high distance or high mileage runner, you kind of think, oh, this comes with the territory, right? Like, this is what it is. And so I was kind of navigating all this stuff while training, um, but I had fell in love with the, uh, the idea that, wow, despite what I think my body looked like or weighed, if I was consistent and I showed up and I did the work, I could accomplish like this big, amazing thing that I thought like was so impossible before. So I was very fueled by that. And I kind of disregarded all the symptoms and just um sucked it up to be honest that was my whole mentality in my 20s and 30s suck it up buttercup like go hard or go home no days off 
And I remember I had all these goals for my first marathon. And while I was doing it, I just felt like crap. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't. And then, you know, you start freaking out, right? I don't know what's going on. Um, I remember at like mile 18, stopping at a pay phone. Can you believe it? There was pay phones back then. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have my cell phone on me, of course. And having to call my boyfriend at mm -hmm. the time, he's now my husband and saying like, look, dude, I'm not going to be at the finish line at this time because I'm really can barely even just walk at this point. My stomach was cramping. I felt nauseous. I felt lightheaded. And I'm just trying to survive at this point. So I'll meet you like much later at the finish line. And when I crossed the finish line, him and my baby sister were there. And I remember they kind of had to help uh, get me across after I crossed the finish line. Like I had to hold on to them because I just felt terrible. Like I was going to pass out. And then I, uh, within like three or five days, it was constantly throwing up, running to the bathroom. And then I was in and out of the bathroom and I was so scared of eating and I wasn't eating anything. And I kept throwing up, going to the bathroom. I was like, oh my God, call my doctor. <laughs> of course, all major things happen on the weekend when the doctor's not there. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, I think it's the stomach flu. What did you eat? And I was, you know, I was naming off. There's probably some bad seafood. And then... They said, wait it out over the weekend. When I come back Monday, if I'm not better, come in. So Monday, I was worse. And when I walked in, um, my doctor looked at me. At that time, I was, you know, in, I had just finished college. I was on like a state assisted medical insurance, what we call Quest here. Mm -hmm. So I was very limited. I couldn't just go to any doctor at any time. So when I went to my um, OB at the time because she was like my only doctor under my medic like state given insurance she looked at me and she's like something's wrong with you I guess I was yellow or something she said and I she had thought I had like some kind of viral infection so I spent the day bouncing around through doctors finally ended up at a GI who was the only GI that could take me and it took 10 days for them to diagnose me but um, once we did a colonoscopy and we had to do an upper scope of my upper stomach, at that time I had like stomach bleeding, stomach ulcers, and then I had ulcers in my colon. And that was the first time he said, oh, you have this thing called ulcerative colitis. And that was how, that was how long ago? So that was in your... That was when I was probably like... Um, 2004. Okay. So we don't have to, to we don't have to say that we don't have to do the math. All right. 2004. <laughs> like mid to late twenties, I believe. Mid and to you late had, 20s. and you had never had any symptoms prior to that. This just all, you had a little bit of stuff, but you thought it might've been something else. So you just totally ignored it thinking it was coming with the territory of turning into a long distance runner. Well, you know, once I got diagnosed, and I didn't believe the doctors and I thought I was invincible and bigger than this thing, this disease. I didn't go back after getting first diagnosed, like within a year until I had a second flare. And then I was like, oh, this is real. But, so when I, when I started to finally get on board, which it took me a long while to get my mindset around this fact that there was something in my life that I could no longer control with studying hard enough, exercising, racing hard enough, dieting hard enough, being disciplined. Then I started to do my own research. Mm -hmm. I also realized that being in Hawaii in a small place with this being my age with this thing, it was kind of uh, unknown. Like I was the only patient at my clinic who had this disease that my GI at that time was like, I'm not really sure about it. Most people I see with issues are in their 60s and 70s and, and all this stuff. So I had to really start to learn how to be my own advocate. And so like listening to all those different people talk and experts who now know a lot more, you know, I think I've had symptoms since I was very young. Okay. That my mom, my mom had me at 17. She was just trying to survive. I was like the, what she tells the practice baby. Um, and now that I think back, you know, um, some of the common things, which I'm really adamant about speaking about vocally, especially with my friends and stuff. I, I got ear infections a lot as a young kid, like shower ear infections. I mean, we're surrounded by water here in uh, the ocean here in Hawaii, the Pacific Ocean. And um, every time I would swim, I would get an ear infection. So my mom was just like, well, you're not going to swim. So I never really learned how to, I never learned how to swim as a kid because I always had this ear infection. Another thing I remember clearly is every time I would go to the bathroom and have like a bowel movement, there would be blood. 
but my mom is old school and i don't know if this is a local hawaii thing or if other moms do this but she was always like you're straining too hard like you're pushing too hard well, no. I mean, probably because she, I mean, she didn't know. I mean, she didn't yeah, know. She, she had you at 17. Yeah, yeah, she didn't know. And I, and I, this is what I remember. So I'm remembering like at eight and nine and 10 at this point, mm-hmm. you know. Another thing is my dad, he's, um he was a, he's a tile setter, like manual labor I grew up. And he kind of was, he had his own like sort of, you know, he was diagnosed mildly bipolar. Um, he had a, bit of OCD that I was was never diagnosed because again local style is you don't talk about this to people you figure it out um, do a lot of self-medicating and diagnosing and so he fixated on a very I I tell people I grew up in a very like medicinal environment because he was very strict he was a germaphobe or whatever we want to call it so constantly cleaning so that combined with my mom being a house cleaner part-time house cleaner when I was growing up we lived like I my husband always makes fun of me because man if you come into my house Clorox pine saw Mr. Clean like use it all like mm-hmm. mix things and make the house smell so good and so and we couldn't go outside and we couldn't play and get dirty and we couldn't make a mess so I really believe that too where some of the stuff I've read about kids who kind of have are diagnosed young they sort of don't have this good bacteria or the gut flora because they're not exposed to a lot of different things to the germs so again, and the dirt yeah all, the yeah, all and- this mm-hmm. stuff um mm-hmm. and then another catalyst which i i didn't really which i go hard now with with people i talk to because i talked to some of the support groups here locally that i didn't put two and two together for me that i am much more adamant where i think it's like the, the biggest dial mover if you're diagnosed with a an, an irritable bowel disease is the stress factor mm-hmm. and not really if you ask me I would take it to the grave to be like I am the least stressed person ever and I really be, believe that for a really long time but what I realized now in my late 40s that I did not in my early 20s is I grew up in a very dysfunctional household and being the oldest girl I was always a middleman and I internalized a lot of that stress. And now I tell people like I, my, my colon absorbed it. Mm-hmm. I truly believe that that happens a lot. People talk about that. It's like your body, your body keeps the score, right? Isn't there, that's a, there's a book, your body keeps yeah, it. Love, and yeah. it really does hold on to anything that has happened in our lives at mm-hmm. all. And it knows, and it won't, it, I mean, it even, it even happens with people like with, with weight, with, with anything, with diseases, I, I truly believe it's with diseases too. It's just your body's like, all right, I've had enough. I've had enough. And we're either going to deal with this or I'm going to make you deal with it. <laughs> yes. I I totally believe that's what happened to me. Yeah. So now what did you do once you realized that this is what I have? I have, you see, I'm going through all of this. Um, you know, I'm not feeling well. You know, you're getting older now because you've had your ostomy for nine years, right? You had it in the end of 2015. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. End of 2015. I got mine January of 2016. Right after me. Like right <laughs> after you. Right after you. And so, you know, what was it like for you um, to kind of go through that life of I'm just going to figure this out, be a, you know, push through it, deal oh with it, God. all those things. And then all of a sudden it's listen, your colon's not working anymore. You've got to make some decisions. What was that like for you? I, I feel the best way to describe it, it was like a slow burn. I think, you know, it was about 11 years that I felt, you know, that I was dealing with severe refractory ulcerative colitis. If I'm honest with people, it took me three or four years of that diagnosis to really take it serious. Because again, I was young and naive. And my ego got in the way. And I thought I was bigger than this thing. I also was in denial that I was using my exercise and my dieting and doing triathlon. I was just getting good in the sport. Like all my work was sort of paying off. And to go from being like non-athletic at all to the frumpy girl that used to get teased in school to like, you know, actually being able to be competitive in a sport a lot of my ego and confidence was tied into that. And I wasn't ready to let it go because I had this thing. 
I still wasn't a big believer. Like even though doctors were telling me, Leanne, there's a fine line for exercise. Like it's, you know, you're, you're having constant flares. We're not getting, we're not able to get you in remission. You need to take a step back. I, I couldn't hear it. And even when I did take a step back and I took a year off of racing here and there, I still didn't work on the mindset piece. Cause even though I wasn't in the act of physically racing and supposedly not pushing my body physically to this limit, the mental head games that I played with myself about missing out and not doing it. I still, I never fully committed to being all in on uh, taking the rest and the recovery and the step and working on what I was distracting myself from with all these other things so that I could really like be like, look, man, you have this disease. Like you need to, you need to work on healing that. And I, and I wasn't ready. So what happened was when I finally felt ready was when, when I say it out loud to people like you, because I've talked to different people, it sounds ridiculous, but I guess I never got to the point where I thought, I never thought in that moment that I would get to a point where I would never get remission. All the pills, all the painkillers, all the infusions, all the shots that I was taking would end up stop working. Mm -hmm. And that really was the, the end all be all for me that kind of was like you said, finally, I, you got to wake up, man, mm -hmm. because I reached a point where literally everything wasn't working. Like I was doing Humira and Remicade and infusions and I was on prednisone like 80 gram, 80 gram milligrams a day. And then I was treating with oxycodone because the pain got so severe and I was still going to the bathroom 50 plus times a day. And then I was starving myself and I felt like I was faking it till I make, made it, you know, but I, my whole life became for the last, I would say two years when it got really bad, where I was like, okay, we got to like figure this out. Like you said, right. Shit hit mm -hmm. the fan. I was, my life was revolved around managing pain, looking for a bathroom in a bathroom or not making it to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And I remember where I just, I'm a very, I don't know why I'm going to say what I'm a very positive person. You know, like formally, there was a point where I told my husband, I was like, dude, I can't, I can't wake up anymore every day and do this anymore. I don't. I'm like physically gone. And I was even scared. Like I said, I'm really like, I'm like the rowdy girl. Like I will take any lemons and make it into lemonade. But at this point, I had no energy and I just didn't want to wake up another day. And I kept bumping up to people, my doctors who were saying like, look at you, you know, I, I always, I never looked emaciated. I never looked sick. I always had a good 20, 30 pounds on me. And I, and I credit that to always being in some shape or form dealing with this thing. I was still very active, I'm still very focused on lifting weights and doing all this thing, which maybe could have been a detriment at some point. But I felt like because I did have this level of, of, self-care that I was able to maintain like a, a body that wasn't what I was telling them. I, I basically kind of told my doctor, like, look, I feel like I'm dying inside, even though outside I look fine. And he was like, well, it's going to be hard pressed to find anybody that wants, that's going to do surgery for a surgeon to do surgery on you because you don't look amazing. This is Hawaii doctors now. So okay. I, mean, I mean, again, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like cuss all like group all Hawaii doctors either. Because at one point in my life, I didn't have stigmas that say my non-resident friends had about care here that were small fish. And, you know, I never, I was born here. So I just thought, no, everybody's smart and does, you know what I mean? But when he kind of told me that, like when he told me, you know, that another GI that I went, because, you know, in Hawaii here, I kind of bounced around a four or five GIs trying to look for the one. One, one GI basically said... He was kind of frustrated because he saw I was getting frustrated that nothing was working for me, that he was like, well, you know, I'm a Buddhist and Buddhists believe that when you get a disease as an adult, you haven't learned a lesson in your youth. So he basically gave me directions to a Buddhist temple where I could go see somebody and maybe work it out. And when I left there, I was like, did this just happen? Like, um, and that was my key to, I need to find a new GI. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. again, you know, then I ended up with, like I said, a GI who was like, well, you look fine. I'm like, well, I feel like I'm dying. 
And then I finally found a really great GI here. Unfortunately, like, you know, we're talking like eight years in on my diagnosis, who kind of really sat me down and explained to me, this is what it is. This is how we treat. These are the layers of the drugs. This is the levels of from, you know, level one drug to level five drug. And he basically told me that, unfortunately, you know, my first GI that I found on state medical insurance, like Quest, through the emergency, and ended up telling me to go to the Buddhist temple. You know, he started me on like a level four drug. Uh, and so he was saying- So you had nowhere to go. And he, that's what he explained to me. But he said, Leanne, you know what? You know, things happen all the time. We don't know everything. If you want to start, let's start over. Let's see. He's like, I honestly don't, I don't want to get your hopes up. But when you're starting at the hardcore level, higher drugs, it's hard to go back to the lower class drugs. And I understood what he meant. But I was willing to try because at that point I was getting desperate. Mm -hmm. So we were trying in the meantime, then I, and I started to take it serious in terms of like, you know, reevaluating what am I thinking? What am I doing? Am I, I sought out and I looked for a therapist who specializes in people with chronic disease because I wanted to make sure that I was making decisions from a level head versus feeling like how I felt, which was hopeless. And then I kind of went down the rabbit hole of alternative therapies. And I really went into debt. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars trying all the other things. IV therapy, all bean diet, all fruit diet, three natural paths. The local shiatsu guy who's like well-known that for $500, he beats the shit out of you and then tells you what, you know, (laughs) I, I remember after that, that was the final draw. I had just finished paying off college. I was debt free. And then I, I was so sick. And here I, you know, trying all these things, I was going into debt again. And I called my husband and I was so sad about it. Cause I was just like, Oh my God, like, I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. And he's like, no, you have to do it. And so I, re- yeah, I went to the shiatsu guy. He's very well known here locally and like Chinese medicine, Dr. Sashiatsu guy. And, you know, he basically, what, what his therapy is, he kind of like looks at you and then he figures out where there's blocked energy and Mm -hmm. he slaps you to try and move that stagnant energy for like three minutes. So I remember like he bent me over the chair and he like sort of pulled down my pants and he slapped me in the back of my, where like your kidneys are. And I just kind of had this jet moment, like, what am I doing? You know, and when I left, I was just very defeated, depleted, and I felt very, I don't know, I don't know why the word keeps coming up, but like used and abused. And I was just like, I need to, I need to like make, find another way. So I pleaded with my GI. And at that time, because they had nothing for me in Hawaii, they said, okay, we're going to send you to the uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and maybe they can get you into a clinical trial. And so I did that in August of 2015. And that was like night and day. Talk about realizing what people say who are not from Hawaii, who have access to care like this. Mm-hmm. They run that like a tight ship. Mm-hmm. So what was that experience? So did you have to go and live in Minnesota for a while? Like, what was that? What was that? Yeah. Sense? That was, that was interesting. Like us Hawaii people, we barely even live Hawaii. That was our first time in like Minnesota. Yes. And of all places, Minnesota. You know, he was, he sent me in the summer because he's like, man, I don't want you to like be battling in the winter. It was two weeks about there, a little over two weeks because I was waiting for a lot of insurance approvals to run stuff. But in terms of like, man, there was a little bit of like, shit, like, had I lived here or placed close to here, would my situation have been different? Because to me, I felt like I didn't feel like a oddball, like that nobody knew. I felt like they see this every day. It was just like, this is what it is or whatever. So it was like clear cut answers. There was still like nothing, like there was no like, oh, let's try this, let's try that. They did a lot of MRIs and stuff. We did a lot of food testing and they said basically like my, for the, almost 11 years that my colon was just so damaged and beat up and that I was risking rupture and 
they would recommend, highly recommend surf. I kind of knew going into that, that's what it would be. I had been in that mindset, which is why, like I said before, I, I went to find this chronic disease therapist, mm -hmm. um, psychologist, because I kind of knew that was like, I was, I was getting ready for it because I just was at the point like, I cannot live like this. So if this means the better alternative to now live half my life, like really living, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to, and I had already started doing research, talking with people about the J pouch, you know, as soon as I thought about it, I started to like join all the Facebook groups about the active people, like all the active people, all the triathletes, all the Ironmans. And, you know, what I realized is, yeah, everybody, you can still do everything every way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no limit. So then I thought, okay, now what is this J pouch thing? And I guess, you know, from what Mayo Clinic told me back then in 2015, that, you know, it's, it's hit, not hit or miss, but they basically said, okay, you would trade severe refractory ulcerative colitis and like, you know, 99% of symptoms to maybe you get 75% of remission. You would live 25% with maybe a little bit of chronic inflammation because of the way that the, they're trying to route the new J-pouch system to create like an artificial sort of colon mm -hmm. and you would be on a lifetime of antibiotics. And I was like, well, that was odd. Don't sound good to me. And, and you know, my mind was like, I just wait, I just spent like 27, 30 years there, you yeah. know, like just managing. I don't want to now for like 75% better. I no. want to be all yeah. better. And the fact that I'm in Hawaii, you know, all those things too, we don't have a surgeon here, I would have to make a trip somewhere else. And then that's like three surgeries in a year. I was like, No, I'm done. It wasn't even a guess for me. I was like, I want everything out. I just want everything out. I want to be done. And I want to live my life. Yeah, and that was when the decision was made. And then when I came back, I met with, we had an, we have an excellent surgeon here who does that. And so I met with him and I felt comfortable. And he was excellent through the whole thing. And so that here, and here we are. So that and was, here and here we are. And that was in 2015 Our seven. Yeah. for the nine years. And what has, and I, I know what life has been like for you, but why don't you like, tell us what has life been like for you since that? Well, I think, you know, what people think, and I've had some friends even say, right, like, because I am, I, I share a lot. I'm vocal about it. I decide to put myself out there with like competing that it must be not bother me or easy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want people to know. It's never easy. I'm grateful to have a chance because again, I tell people I was sick for so long that I forget what I forgot what hundred percent healthy felt like for mm -hmm. real. Like I was so grateful because I feel so amazing after that I'm just super grateful to have that because I know that there's a lot of people who have Crohn's or colitis that even though they have surgery, they still suffer and they still deal with a lot of symptoms and aftermath. And I knock on wood have been fortunate to not have any of that. So I think like anything in life, like you said, we go, everybody goes through something. It all, I'm a big believer in how you approach it and how you think about it. And that it could be a very like literally shitty situation mm -hmm. <laughs> or it could be like a, a, the greatest thing. I'm like any other person. I'm human. I have my insecurities. Sometimes I think, man, it would be, if I was a dude, would I be, would it be easier for me? Cause you know, we have, I have this whole wrapped up thing about, you know, when you're your woman and da da da. Uh, but when I knew I had to have surgery, I was like, you know what? I had some naysayers, like some people that I knew, not in my close circle, but that would have opinions about it. Like, you know, life is over. And I was like, I'm the type of person where if you tell me I can't, you're gonna do it. That's how, oh yeah, girl, we're the same, same. Tell me I can't, I dare you. I am by and so I had a couple of people that I was surprised that had some comments about it like wow life's gonna be over and, I, and I'm like I'm gonna show you I'm gonna live my best fucking life because um I've been through way too much shit to like let this dictate how my what my next move is and now I've like embraced it in fact in, in the idea that because I've been talking to local groups here and people 
to hear people, especially women who tell me like they don't want to go to the beach. They don't want to wear a bikini. They don't want to wear a one piece. They don't want to go in a jacuzzi. Um, they only wear certain clothes. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sad. I feel sad for them because again, I feel like this is it, right? We, we, we were dealt this deck of cards where you get this diagnosis and that dictates how, how you live and how you thrive because it's out of your control. Like we know, like I hate when people, so many people have their opinions, right? Well, it's the diet. It's your diet. It's going to go blue and free. Eat I'm like, oh my gosh, shut up. Like, I just want to punch those people because it's just like, no, this is something that's just, I'm just wired, you know? And to be honest, my grandfather had an ostomy mm -hmm. um, on my dad's side. So I definitely do believe there's a genetic component. My whole family on my dad's side, there's a GI issue. i am got the colon thing. My dad got the kidney stone thing. My brother has the gallbladder other thing my sister has RA um so it's just like people yeah so I just am like I I tell them like man I spent like 11 years like living because this disease controlled how I lived where I went da, da, da. now that I don't have that I'm gonna eat what I want I'm gonna wear what I want <laughs> Exactly. And you're in Hawaii. So you're wearing the bathing suits. And you know, it's funny. It's not funny. It's it is sad. I agree with you. Like when people are like, I'm afraid to wear that. But when you when you can help someone go through that first time of wearing a one piece at the at the beach, or that that first time that they say, you know what the heck with it, I'm just going to go out you know, and just be me in it and not be afraid or not hide it or not just, you know what I mean? And yeah. it, it's so empowering. I mean, wearing one piece, no, nobody knows you, you've got a bag. Nobody knows it's, they have yeah. no idea, no idea. Yes. And, and again, women and people, men and women, mostly women, we're so self-conscious about what we look like all the time. Anyway, yeah. gardening, right? right? Exactly. So most people aren't looking at you, judging you. They're thinking about themselves. <laughs> Yeah, and you nailed it in the head where I say, I think my saying is, you don't know if I don't show. And that's, that's what right. I tell people. But I remember, though, when I first got my surgery and I, I was ready to leave the house and like go to the gym, I did have a little bit, which caught me off guard, like anxiety or panic attack, mm -hmm. because I just thought everybody's going to know. Mm -hmm. But like anything in life, and you know, I'm a personal trainer and macro coach and all that. So I'll, it's always like exposure therapy, like anything, right? Like mm -hmm. adding that forbidden fruit, trying that uncomfortable thing. The more you weigh in yourself every day, because a lot of women don't want to weigh their cells or whatever. With the more you do it, the more less reaction you you create, right? Exactly. The more immune you get to it. So then, you know, like again, people like anything on social media, they don't they don't, they see the highlight reel, right? But I don't want to negate the fact that I think the way I explain it to some friends who don't understand. Because I am good at kind of going with the flow and pivoting. And if something happens, like being able to kind of like turn it around or whatever that it's like, it's like waking up one day and you have like a, a, a Siamese twin attached to you. That's how I say it. that it's something that you need to be aware of. And that needs to be taken care of for, for, you know, several times a day, mm -hmm. you know, it's sometimes you can be out of sight, out of mind, but for the most part, it's going to be this thing that you now have to like care for because now it's a part of you so there's a lot of backstory to go with that but again like yeah like people people don't know because they're not in your body yeah they're not and they don't understand so let's go back for a minute when you said you were you know you were seeing a therapist helping you and you believe it's mind over matter it's like past traumas things like that yeah what have you done and what what kind of things did you get to do did you do to get past that to get through that the trauma or the probably I would say like I would say the trauma like let's start with the trauma like what are some of the things like I know we talk I talk a lot about people and that a lot of people like they'll journal they'll get some things out of their oh, okay, I see, I do, you know what I mean like some of that like what am I doing you know I got to get this out of myself out of my body and so yeah. they'll journal a ton I journal every single morning I'm up like Bleh. here's everything um you know just to get it out of me yeah. Was that part of what you did or were there some other things that you did as well? Yeah, I think that was hard for me. Like I've tried to, you know, like I can't journal. I've tried. I do sometimes, but it's not like I, it's not like something I naturally gravitate to. 
again, for a really long time, it was exercise. I purged my emotions through exercise. I mm-hmm. coped it. Um, I think having a therapist, a long time therapist, when I hired my chronic disease therapist, that wasn't the first time I was in therapy. I have been um, consistent on therapy since I was probably 18 because I knew that um, I had a tremendous amount of uh, stress and guilt because my parents were, at that time, this is about 30 years ago, they, they battled a, a heavy drug addiction. Mm-hmm. And I'm the oldest of five. And being the oldest of five, I was put in the middle a lot. And in the height of their addiction, I had to make a very, it was, it was survival decision where I was like, I need to put myself in college and leave this situation and let them figure it out because I'm the kid. And that was really hard because with me, my brother is right under me and we're close in age. And I think he felt very much abandoned. So I had a tremendous amount of guilt. So I, I started therapy really young because I'm the type where, wow, you know, the I'm in college and the state is giving me this insurance and they said I can go to therapy. So I'm going to take advantage of it. That's mm-hmm. how I was because I had the, I had the ability to do it and I'm going to I'm going to do it because I couldn't deal. I was so I was in the super mindset like and again, if people have and a lot of people have now, but when you deal with people in your family that are addicted if you're really young and you're really naive to the whole disease of that, you mm. really believe you can save them. So I spent a good 10, 15 years trying to rescue, dealing with, with thoughts of, well, if you just love me, you would get clean, believing, you know, with stories and just kind of like being in this tug of war. And so therapy really helped me. I needed to set boundaries, which was hard. Mm-hmm. And so I had to like sort of, really eliminate myself. So I think for me, the, the main thing was, again, a dial mover was just seeking out support. Um, and I know a lot of people like to talk to family or friends, but I feel like when you have a therapist, they're not, they're an unbiased third party. They mm-hmm. call you out on your shit when you need to be. And I needed that. Um, I was in such a local style here is kind of like, you don't talk about your family's business. Family loves family, no matter what. And I was sick of that. I was like, no, this is not right. This is, we need to do something different. So having a therapist provide the safe space and then give me permission to say, look, if you need to cut off ties with your parents, that's, that's exactly what you should do to give me that permission. Because when people hear that, they're like, oh, you're such a bitch. Why do you do that? You know, da, 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 da. But I needed that. So it was boundaries. And then again, also just really like looking at what my, behaviors were like yeah I wasn't a drug addict but I was an exercise addict Mm -hmm. and I and I wasn't and I wasn't for a long time ready to admit that um so again through therapy and different therapists having to like just talking with them and having them to them talk to you about a different perspective about what you're doing and why you're doing and then really realizing that for really like half my life a lot of go hard or go home was like a survival mechanism, fight mm-hmm. or flight. And that that served me well for a really long time. But to now know in this season of my life, I don't need to always operate in survivor mode, like at all costs, like go big, go home kind of thing, that it's okay to trust other people and rely on other people. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to admit that you need help and that you're not as strong as you think. And it's not a sign of weakness. And so- yeah, I think that was for me, I, therapy and having a support, like especially my husband, I'm, I'm really grateful to have a partner who kind of like, because he, he was seen it all with me. And so I'm just really grateful for that because not a lot of people have that one person in their corner, right. you know, like I've been able to have. Right, right. Well, I am grateful that you have, I have, and you've done fitness competition since with you did it. You just finished a competition last year, right? With your bag. Yeah, that was interesting. So I even in my early 20s, like, like every other gal, when you're like, you want to lose a bunch of weight, and you're like, Oh, I want to do a bikini show or whatever. I tried to, um, again, and it was all fueled by this very disordered place of, of loathing. Mm-hmm. And also a level of distraction to kind of not deal with whatever is going on in here. And I tried really hard. And I think, like I tell people, you know, in various seasons of our life, we exhibit energy. 
and we attract that energy back. So I've always found myself like being in these situations where it's just more punishing mm -hmm. and more like, this is what it has to look like. This is what it has to be. It has to be awful and miserable and you have to suffer. And it's because you're not, you know, as genetically gifted as everybody else. And so I had like unfinished business with this competing thing, but I, I let it go. And then um, about in 2012, I decided again, it's like, you know, kind of same thing with battling the colitis and then having surgery and really dealing with things that got me there and what I needed to work on. I think the second season of life for me was reevaluating my relationship with dieting and exercise. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't get that too. I think people think like if you have this disorder, but how can that be a disordered thing with food and exercise? Because you don't look anorexic or, you know, da 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 da. But like I tell them, you can make anything good, bad, if you do mm -hmm. too much of it. And if it's mm -hmm. coming from a shitty place, right? A self hate place versus a self-love place and so when I was uh, I think in 2019 I kind of had another devastating life event and I just needed I just was like when I came out of that depression it was like a two-year depression I was like I don't want to do food and fitness the way I did it anymore. like I need to find a better way like not restriction not dieting not, not anything and so I joined, at that time, I, I was watching this group online called TWW. And there was one coach who worked with a lot of people with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what, that's what I need. Somebody to talk me off the ledge. Because I can do, I can run my body into the ground mm -hmm. all the time. I need somebody to do the opposite. And some women can't understand that, right? Because usually it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I need somebody to stop, you know, to tell me to stop this, stop that. And so that was kind of like, um, a beginning level where I really like, wow, I changed my relationship in terms of with dieting and exercise. And then that kind of like spiraled this thing where like, Hey, do you think you want to try and do this thing? And the only reason why I decided to go through with it was because man, it was totally a completely different mindset place that I did that. It was like, can I like, how advanced can I get my body to be? without any kind of funny business mm -hmm. and can I go up there and preach practice what I preach in terms of saying like if you want to be an example and this is what you set out you keep I keep telling myself that's what I want to do inspire and motivate inspire and motivate mm -hmm. in different ways then this is like something that you got to see through <laughs> to be honest it's sort of like fake it till you make it the whole time like I was like scared you know but I'm like man you don't you know it's it'll be okay the fear little fear is good and then even when I went to the the way we do it in Hawaii is you have a day show and then you come back for the night show I found myself even be like I don't need to come back to the night show if anything right just <laughs> I was so scared but when it's all said and done I think it was like a really like full circle life-changing moment for me mm -hmm. but I don't how did you feel when you competed were you yeah. like scared so well I competed forever ago so I competed like I competed when I was 39 so I compete I've always worked out always been in the gym yeah. always been a gym rat that after I got married I got relaxed with my workouts. So I gained a little weight and then I hired a trainer and she got me and we started working out. And then she's like, Hey, do you think? And I said, Hey, yeah, let's go. So it's funny. You said TWW because Michelle McDonald yeah. uh, is a friend of mine. So uh -huh. that's how far back I go in the world of competing. So Michelle and I used to compete together. So we competed. So I did the, so I did my first competition and she, it was just, for me, it was fun. You know, it was just this fun thing that I was going to go and do. And I did figure but I switched to bikini. Cool. I competed for a few years and then I turned into one uh, coach for one of the largest editors at the time. Michelle was one of the part of the team that we had. Yeah. So we were all part of a team that all did this stuff together, like camps together and all of this. And then I, I coached for that team for a while. Um, and then after mine, after I had my surgery, it was one of those things where I had to do it because going into surgery, I was like, I live in a bathing suit. Like you have no idea. Like I uh, literally live in a bathing suit, um, you know, getting on stages and all this stuff. And I'm coaching all these girls. Like, like I can't have this. So 
when it came time of, Hey, it's save your life or let the cancer take you, you choose. It was like, okay, let's save my life. So two, it was about a year and a half. And one of the coaches that I, that I was really good friends with, um, I said, all right, I'm going to do this. And so she's like, all right, let's get you trained up. So I just trained and I was more scared of slipping and falling when I, did my, I didn't do local shows. I always did the big one. So I did the Vegas, I did Miami, I did, you know, Rolls, I did all of those. So I was like, just don't slip and fall on your, just don't fall. But I, when I came out, cause I had, I did bikini and my costume was wings. So I had wings, okay. big black wings, and then my swimsuit and I had the wings covered. So when I came out and I opened the wings, everybody stood up, everybody hooted and hollered and clapped and everything else. Now it was like, don't fall and don't cry. So it was more for me, like the bird was like freeing. Like it was just, the whole thing was freeing. And I did it because I wanted people to know, no matter what your body looks like, you can still do the things that you wanted to. You're still beautiful regardless. Like you're not defined because we, there's nothing worth, I mean, fitness competitions, you're literally standing there in a bathing suit and they are judging you. And yeah. look. I mean, and when I did it years ago, I'm like, if I can do this, then I can get up on stage and talk to people. I can go into meetings and talk to people. Like I can do anything. And so when I did that, that, so that was me doing it. I was just very comfortable because it was me, my group of my friends. I had everybody around me. I had this huge support system. And so it was very easy for me just to kind of fall back into doing that. Now, um, I don't, I, I'm good. I did one. I, I'm now, you know, at 53, I'm like, I'm living life, working out, doing my thing, eating my food and, you know, being a grandmother and doing all that. But that was my experience when it came to like, the competition. It really was. It was just Leanne. It was showing myself, not just everybody else, but showing myself that I can still do things like that. Of course. I love right? that. Yeah. Yeah. Like to do a WBFF show. That mm -hmm. was the whole point. And I, I, I tell people it was like a three year prep in the making mm -hmm. kind of thing, to be honest. And I was just so proud because I never that resorted to, again, when I say funny business, like I know how to work this system and the scale and I know about all the restriction and all that. And I was proud when I, when I decided to do it different in 2019, mm -hmm. I never like, you know, run and then weigh myself or fast all day or do, do diet pills or whatever, all the shit I used to do and wreck my body with in my twenties and thirties. And then the, this whole thing blew up with WBFF. I don't know if you I was in there. Yeah, I heard and, all of it. And Michelle and the TWW team, they pulled out, which I totally understand. Mm -hmm. But then I was left with a little bit of like, oh, I I work you like my ass off. Literally, mm -hmm. I was like so surprised when I leaned out, like I had like absolutely no ass. I was like, oh my God. It's like not come, the last place where I wanted to go. But, and what happened was just so happened there was a, I was supposed to do like WBFF and I think it was in Mexico or no, Atlantic City. City. Yep. There was a Hawaii show. We have like three or four shows a year, but they're IFBB and NPC mm -hmm. only. And they happened to have one in November. Um, I talked with my coach at, at the, in that time, I kind of transitioned. I changed teams during that time because there was a whole lot of like sort of change going on with TWW and I felt like I needed a more of a experienced prep coach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I joined team dynasty uh, and they, I just broached it to her. You know, I was like, Hey, it's, you know, I, what do you think? I'm not trying to, I, I'm not trying to be sponsored. I'm not trying to place. I, this is like a personal goal. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like I got so close so many times throughout my, my years, like no cigar. Right. Mm hmm. I'm like now left with the like, can I even do it? Like, do I have what it takes? So that's really like, for me, it's more from like an athlete's standpoint. Mm -hmm. Can I like level up as an athlete? And she's like, that's a great goal. She's like, you're in a good solid place. If we set the expectation, we know that this is sort of like a practice show to see, do you like it? Do you like the way it goes? Do you like prep? We'll see where your weaknesses are when you lean out. Then yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then, so within the six, when I changed, we had like six weeks out and they kind of brought me to stage. And at that point I was like, everything that I had been taught up to that point and that I had been through with other prep coaches to that point, I was like, this was like the most enjoyable experience mm -hmm. to be honest, not mm -hmm. because it wasn't a grind and work because it was, there was like sacrifice and, and moodiness, but 
it was never to me what I had thought of like white knuckling or like really hating it. We hear a lot of gals that compete and they talk about their stories after like it was a it's a mind F and da da da. And I was like, well, I really believe this was like a whole how you go into it. It is. And you were going into it in a whole, like, I'm not here to place. I'm not here. to. I'm just here to show myself that I can do this. And there are so many women, there are so many people, not just women. There's so many people that go into that. And, and it is a sport. Nobody believes it. They're like, it's a complete sport. I mean, you're lifting weights for a few years. You're leaning out. You're, you're doing hits. You're, you're counting every piece of asparagus. It's one in your body at some point. Right. (laughs) Right. You're like drinking a gallon of water a day. You're doing all these things, but it's a lot of people go into it. Like I'm going to go in and win. I'm going to come in and win. And some, okay, fine. If you want to go in with that, but you're not going to always look like that. Like that yeah. moment on stage is a moment on stage because you're going to go backstage and you're going to drink some water. And guess what? Your abs are gone. Your yeah. abs are gone. Just like that. No more abs, right? So you have to cut and you have to be very careful dieting coming out of those things too, because it can mess with, it can mess with your body and it can mess with your mind. But to be able to, get, if you can get there being like, oh my gosh, I actually look like this. Like I can do this. I can get up on stage. I can still do push ups. You know, I can do all these strong, wonderful things. Um, you know, it is how you go into it to come out of it. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. Well, Leanne, I truly appreciate talking to you this week. And I know the listeners loved your story. I know they've probably learned a ton from you. And I always ask this of everyone. Um, and seeing that this is going to be the last episode, guys, I'm just reminding you, this is the last episode through the summer. I am taking the entire summer off. Yeah. First time ever in four years. I'm taking three months off. I will, we will be back in September. No pressure, Leanne. But the thing I always ask everybody is if you were to leave our listeners with one thing, what would that one thing be? One thing. I think the number one thing is that you got to really love yourself. And that starts there. I think so many people take care of everybody else or take care of every other thing, thinking that it's like, to me, the back it's backwards, right? Um, no matter what we do, if we want to work out, if we want to start a new career, do some other big goal, if it's not coming from first a place of like self-love, I always say it has to come from self-love, not self-love. Because so many times we're, we're like just so much about beating ourselves up and bullying ourselves into doing the thing. Well, I need to be more disciplined. I need to be smarter. I need to be thinner. And it's always we're doing something for, with from a negative slant. And once we start to like kind of just quiet that noise and really learn to figure out what do we really appreciate about ourselves and love about ourselves, I feel like other everything else falls into place. It really does. And what a way to leave us through the summer. Leanne, thank you again so much for being here with us this week. I truly appreciated getting to know you even more. Uh, thank you so much, Leanne. You're so welcome. It. You're so welcome. And to everyone else, uh, if you love this show, share it. Don't forget to subscribe, to hit that subscribe button, to rate, leave a review. They mean a lot. It gets the message out more and more. Um, And I will see you all again come September. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.